Hey, it's Professor Kitchigan for more fun with soils. So this video lesson is all about capillary rise and effective stress. And for this lesson, I need to take you to the beach. Well, this is as close as we can get to the beach in my lab. Here I have a cup that's filled with loose, dry sand, the kind that you might find at the beach, way up the beach above the high tide line where it's all nice and dry. And then, to demonstrate capillary rise, I'm going to pour water into this basin and we're just going to let it sit there for a while and just see what happens. Wow, look at what happened. That water was sucked all the way up to the top of the cup full of sand. And watch this. If I take the cup off, the sand stands up. Pretty cool, huh? Well, to help explain how the water rose up in the soil, I'm going to repeat an experiment you've probably seen in one of your science classes before, and that's the rise of water in capillary tubes. So I have three tubes here, three glass tubes, and each with a different diameter hole down the middle of them. There's a big one and a medium and a small one. And what I'm going to do is put them here in this little glass dish. And then I'm going to add some red food coloring to the dish. And then we're going to watch what happens. So that you can see what happened when I put these three tubes into this red water, I'm going to lift them up here together so you can see what they look like. And now you can see in each one of them how much the water has risen in the tubes. We call these capillary tubes. And notice the one on the left that has the biggest hole rose this, the, the least distance up the one in the middle in between, and the one on the right that had the smallest hole rose even higher. And like I said, I, I expect you've seen this experiment before. But I wanted to demonstrate this to help explain capillary rise in soils. Let's briefly review the capillary tube experiment to show how the water rises in the tubes. So I have, I'm going to show two different capillary tubes here. One that's about that big and then another one that's going to be smaller. And those were both in a dish that had red water in it. See that water level is up to here. And what we observed was in this larger tube, the water had risen up the tube, and if we could have seen really carefully, we would have seen a meniscus there, really hard to see in the tubes. And in the smaller tube, the water rose up higher, and that meniscus would have been, would have been even more curvy. It would have had a much smaller radius of curvature. So what's causing this water to be able to rise up the tube? Well. To understand that, first we have to remember that water looks like Mickey Mouse. It's a polar mo molecule, right? And we have two H's there and an O in the middle. And so it's a charged particle, and, the par and they're, the aren't, they aren't balanced. So the O's want to stick to the H's. And so the next water molecule will be attracted to this one in this way. And so because it's a charged particle, the water molecules want to hang on to each other. They're kind of sticky if you want to think about it. So if I draw a free body diagram of what's going on in here, that stickness of the water 
particles allows them when there there's an atmospheric an open to the atmosphere one side to develop a surface tension in here and this surface is actually being pulled like a rope so there's a tension there and that tension is able to hold up this mass of water because it's pulling it up now the interesting thing here is in order for that water to be pulled up here there must be uh, uh, tension in the water itself in other words the water is not at the same pressure as it is down here. If I was to install a pressure gauge here, and if I hook that pressure gauge up just right to the surface of this water, and I measured what the, the, the fluid pressure in it was there, it would be reading one atmosphere. But if I disconnected that from there, and hooked it up instead over to the tube. If I could magically hook it up the tube, I would find that the fluid pressure in the air would actually be negative. There would be a negative pore pressure in there. And the farther up the tube I moved it, the more negative the pressure would be. So the polarity of the water molecule allows it to, to create this surface tension and it allows it to pull up this column of water. But in pulling up that column of water, the water itself has to be in tension. So the, the important thing to know is the fluid pressure inside the capillary tubes is less than atmospheric, or it's a negative pore pressure. That'll come important later. Well, to explain how the capillary tubes relate to the soil, I'm just here drawing a representation of our cup of soil. So here's our cup of soil, and it's filled with all these solid mineral particles of the soil. And right now, they're completely filled with air. When I put that soil in this pan and gave it access to water, that water started to fill all these interstitiary areas, the little areas between the particles. and, and gets sucked up into the soil through all these little teeny areas between the particles. Now there's not a single capillary tube up there, but there is instead a whole interlaced three-dimensional connection of these little tubes between all the soil particles, you, you can imagine it. And the water ends up in between all these areas of the particles. And the big holes, like this, aren't going to get filled with water but the little areas in between them all are. And that's just like a, uh, a little network of these teeny little capillary tubes that are all pulling this water up through surface tension up into the soil. So if I was to take a close-up of this little area up here, the interface between just two soil particles, so I have one particle here that's smaller than the other one, and the other one's pretty big, has a bigger radius of curvature. So this is solid soil material, and this is also solid. And in between, I'm going to have that little meniscus being formed, that surface tension. And this is all going to be full of that red water that I pulled up into the capillary tube. So this is going to be capillary water. It's going to be between the two pieces of soil solid. And out in this region, this is going to be air at atmospheric pressure. So it's not as simple as the capillary tube where it just comes straight up the tube. It's just an interclosed, uh, interwoven network of a whole bunch of little tubes. And the water is able just to keep pulling itself up through there through this surface tension that we saw. Same, same phenomenon as in the capillary tube, just a little more complicated. And the important thing to realize is this capillary water is going to have a pore pressure. If I could magically measure, if I could magically stick a gauge in there and measure the pore pressure, it's going to have a negative value, just like in the capillary tube. Now I want to combine the phenomenon of capillary rise, which we already observed, with the concept of effective stress to explain to you why sandcastles work at the beach.
Obviously, to do that, we need to go to the beach. But since it's such a long way between San Angelo and the beach, I brought the beach to us. So here I have the beach. I've got this nice sand. Uh, this is the sand partway down the beach, uh, not quite into the water, but it's nice and moist. And this is that sand that's way up the beach above the uh, high tide line that's all nice and dry. And you've probably all done this a million times as kids, or if you haven't, you should have. Uh, but here's my sand at the top of the beach. It's all nice and dry, and I'm going to put that in my little beach bucket, and you know what's going to happen when I take the bucket off, right? It's just going to dump out into a big pile. It's not going to stand up or hold up at all. But as we all know, anybody who's ever built a sand castle knows if I go to the sand where it's nice and moist, not where it's all soaking wet down in the water. In fact, you'll know that if you've done this, you can't dig too deep in the sand to make this work. But if you go to where the sand is nice and deep, I'm sorry, if you go to where the sand is moist and you fill your bucket, you can make a really cool sand castle. In fact, it has uh, strength, so much strength, I could actually trim it up. And you see people doing this. They're taking their trowels and they're trimming it all around. And it's standing up. Well, why is it, if you think about it, that I can trim this moist sand into a nice cylinder and it has the strength to stand up, where my dry sand, if, if I had it in a cylinder, it just dumps into a big pile. It has to do with capillary rise and effective stress. And to even demonstrate it just a little more, I want you to watch here. I, I, you may have noticed I made a little hole in the middle of my, my sandcastle cylinder here. Now what I'm going to slowly do is add water into the middle of the cylinder. I want to add it slowly because I don't want to erode any soil, but I want you to see what happens as I add water to... Oh my gosh, what's happening? Look what happened when I add water to the soil. And this is not erosion, right? It's not like uh, flowing water. But when I add water to that moist soil, it falls down just like my dry sand did. And the difference is, there's a big difference between a moist soil and saturated soil. So when the soil is moist but not completely saturated, I can get it to stand up. Right? If it's moist, not completely saturated, I can get it to stand up. I'll do that again. All right? So this soil isn't saturated. But if I then go and saturate that soil, it all just falls down. Let's go check this out on the board. Okay, let's see if we can explain why a dry sandcastle doesn't work at all. A moist sandcastle works great, but a saturated sandcastle doesn't work any better than a dry sandcastle. And I'm going to explain that using three simple concepts which we've already known. So the first is that the effective stress is equal to the total stress minus the pore pressure the most important equation of all soil mechanics. The second one is that the strength of a sand is equal to its effective stress times the tangent of the friction angle. And we learned that from our sand test. And the last one is this capillary rise phenomenon, that within the capillary water, because of this meniscus is formed and surface tension, within the capillary water, the capillary pore pressure is going to be negative. Those three concepts can explain what just happened on the beach. So let's start with our dry soil. So here's my little cylinder of dry soil. I'm going to make it vertical just to make it easier. Now this soil has some weight which would tend to want it to cause, cause it to fail. It won't stand up by itself. So when we formed our sand castle, we put it in a little cup, and right? We put a cup on there. Now this cup was, was stiff and it provided a hoop stress in the cup which actually provides a normal stress to the cylinder of soil. So there's a sigma H here, a normal stress that's being provided by 
the cup itself all around the soil, a horizontal stress. All right, so if there's a horizontal stress there, what's my effective stress? Well, we know that the horizontal effective stress is going to be the horizontal total stress minus the pore pressure. But what was my pore pressure inside this specimen? Well, in the dry one, it was equal to zero. There's no water in there, it's just air. So there's no pore pressure. So this is equal to zero. And so my horizontal effective stress is just equal to the horizontal total stress. So at the beginning, I have some shear strength because I have a effective stress times the tangent of my friction angle, and there's going to be a finite effective stress here. And it's being provided by this hoop stress from the cup. Well, what happened when I took the cup away? Well, I take the cup away, and when I take the cup away, all my horizontal stress goes away, right? So, my horizontal stress just, my horizontal total stress just went to zero, so my horizontal effective stress goes to zero, and so this is zero, and so my shear strength now went to zero, so I have no shear strength left. I still have the weight of the soil here, and it just falls down into that big pile that we saw there. So it fails in shear all the way through here until it just comes down and makes a big pile, because I have no shear strength. I have, I have uh, no effective normal stress. I've got no shear strength. Okay, well, let's look. This is for our dry soil. So let's look at our moist soil. So here's our moist soil. It's going to be moist. Now I'm going to go ahead and leave the um, cup off of this because we already know where it stands up, but once I take the cup off, the horizontal stress is equal to zero, right? I still have my weight of the soil here that's going to tend to want to cause it to fail on these shear planes in here, but it stands up. Well, why does it stand up? Well, let's go back to our equation, right? We have the total, the effective horizontal stress is going to be equal to the total, total horizontal stress minus the pore pressure. Well, what's the difference between this case and this case? Well, in this, in the moist case, Remember, between every single one of my soil particles here, I have this meniscus formed of capillary water. So I have capillary water between each one of these. And remember that within those capillary menisci, the pore pressure is negative. So inside this specimen, all throughout this specimen, I have U cap, and it's a negative value. So we're going to calculate my horizontal effective stress here. So the total stress is equal to zero. However, the pore pressure here is equal to, is minus U cap, right? But U cap is a negative number, so my horizontal stress here is actually going to be a positive number. Right? The horizontal effective stress is going to be a positive number because I'm going to have zero minus a negative number and I'm going to have a positive value here for the effective stress. So I have a positive effective stress and the shear strength is going to be equal to the capillary pore pressure, the absolute value of the capillary pore pressure, times tangent of phi. And so in this soil, I have a positive shear strength even though there's no horizontal normal stress. And that's why the sandcastle stands up. So what happens when it goes from being moist to goes to being saturated, where S is equal to 100%? Well, when it's saturated, I'm going to be filling up all the area between all these particles with water. That's what happened when I stuck my tube down in here and I started to trickle water into it. I was filling up all this area with water. Well, what happens to my capillary here when this gets filled with water? It goes away. In order for there to be a surface tension, there has to be an water on this side and air on this side between those particles. I guess I should put an R in water. 
there has to be an air-water boundary in order for this capillary surface to, sh to form. When this is all full of, when the, when the air is gone and this is all full of water, there is no more capillary surface. So now what happens to my pore pressure? Well, when, it, when S is equal to 100%, the U inside here goes from being negative to being slightly positive. It's not very high because this is only a few inches high, but it's no longer negative. So what happens to my horizontal effective stress? Well now, my horizontal effective stress is equal to my horizontal total stress, right, which is equal to zero, minus my pore pressure. Well this is now a small positive number, so now I have my horizontal effective stress is a very small negative value. And so my shear strength, S, is equal to sigma prime times tangent of phi prime. This is going to be slightly negative, which means I'm basically going to have no shear strength. And so when, I, when this gets saturated and completely filled up with water, again, my soil just fails in a big pile. So that explains why when you go to the beach and you want to build a nice sand castle, you want to get it in that part of the beach that's not dry sand and it's not saturated sand, but that nice moist place in between. And it's all because of the concept of effective stress, the fact that our strength of our sand is frictional and it depends on having an effective normal stress, and the capillary pore pressure is negative. So next time you go to the beach, with your nieces and, and you take them out to build sandcastles, you can give them a lecture on capillary rise, effective stress, and the strengths of sands. And so have fun at the beach.